climbing things that other people spend their life trying to get up and fall off of, and he was doing it without a rope. I thought he was insane. It was for sure he's never gonna spend that money. I just thought, wow, you know, he is bigger than life. $10,000, I mean, it, it was just such a wild thing. You know, it, it, um, it, it seemed all part and parcel. You know, he's out there doing the Gillette Razor commercial. He's just soloing the hardest things imaginable, doing these incredible climbs that I have no intention of ever even trying. I mean, some people thought it was just like super arrogant. You know, apart from something really blatant bad guy, you know, I just sort of accept it in, in the way that, you know, he's, he's John. <laughs> Ten thousand dollar bet. I mean, that that's just puerile backer. No one took him up on that. You're a dead man if you did. <laughs> or freaking stupid. John's an intensely competitive fellow, and he was in an intensely competitive milieu. It seemed a little excessive to me, but I mean, it was something to admire. But that was something to sort of almost laugh at. People took it seriously, really? and and they said, "I ain't following him anywhere." I'll die. Goading people to their death. As soon as Peter started, we didn't hear any, any more about a 10 grand. It never even occurred to me to try go for the $10,000. The kind of stuff that John was solo on Baby Apes, I couldn't even do it on a rope. John was brash. There's no doubt about it. But I mean, one of the things is he could back it up. You know, it's hard to run into people, and my son is one of them. I don't know, hardly too many people that can do that. There are people who do this that will just stick it in your face in this way. And he won't go up and, and jawbone you. He'll just do it and say, there, look at that. The mainstream magazines just thought it was great. They thought that was real free climbing, you know? And all the other climbers hated me. And it was like, well, you see, uh, climbing with a rope is, is actually free climbing because you're not using the rope to climb the rock and you're not pulling on the pitons or the rope or anything. You're actually making it with your hands and feet, you know? And the media is like, the mainstream media is like, yeah, yeah, whatever, dude. This, dude, this is the real stuff. You take the rope off and that's free climbing. The first time he, uh, he was a climber is when he climbed out of his crib. And he climbed to the door, he got on a chair, opened the door, and he was going to the store for bubble gum. You know, he's always daring, you know. Uh, I'll never forget the first time I took John and his brother, 17 months younger, Dan, skiing in Mammoth. And, Good God Almighty, he was, he was jumping over things. He didn't even know how to turn yet. Dad actually had a friend, and he would tell us stories about like climbing. This guy named Dale Vrabeck. And I, don't, I, don't, I never met him, you know, but he sounds like he's, you know, 30 feet tall. And it was pretty obvious that Dad admired this guy. I didn't climb. I didn't like uh, heights. Uh, but although I did do things like uh, go up to Lake Adiza in the Mammoth area, you know, in the Minarets. And I didn't want any technical climbing. Just when I, I was learning what divorce was, I think I was either five or six, and I thought, that'll never happen in our family, you know? And, and like two weeks later, it did, and, and Dad took us to the park, and uh, you know, that was pretty awful. That was, that, that was, I'll never forget. I would see Dan and John on various weekends, and Yvonne, my now wife, would take them up to Save on Drugstore uh, on Sepulveda in Manchester. And there's, it's on the corner, uh, the south, uh, west corner, John would climb the corner of the building and the manager would come out and have to knock him off. <laughs> uh, naturally, because of my professional baseball, I urged them both to play ball. And it was cool to have a dad that could um, take a fungo bat and you know, hit balls and, and play. And, and, and man, he could, he could hit the ball. He could. And it was cool watching him. And they did play Little League and John was a catcher. And he was really gutsy. Yeah. He wasn't so big. He's not a big guy, you know. But he would get in there and it didn't matter who the hell was coming in there, he wouldn't yield an inch. <laughs> he'd let him collide with him and he'd tag him out. Is Dan a lot like that? Oh, well? Dan is a tremendous baseball player, but Dan somehow or other just didn't want to pursue it. I couldn't run though, see I had a fat butt. In <laughs> <laughs> Dan is bigger, he's about six, two and a half or three, but he just didn't go and finish at all, you know. Boy, he could hit a ball a mile. My God. That was a struggle. That was a battle, you know. In the one hand, he was teaching us dedication and, and pursuing an activity, 
you know, to the exclusion of others and, and trying to achieve excellence. And um, on the other hand, the exact activity, I, you know, I struggled with. He gave us the uh, original fuck you attitude, you know, which was kind of, you know, just go in there and kick some ass. I'm competitive and I, you know, I, I, I guess I imparted to my kids, both Dan and John, that, um, you know, if you believe in something and you've thought it through, then you, you know, you stick by it. But you modify too if you have to um, alter your views and you get new information, that sort of thing. But, you know, be strong about it if you're really positive that you're right. But make sure you're right. Who knows why Clement took, you know, just took and just got him by the short hairs and just wouldn't let him go. But he was, he was really into it from, from day one. The first or second book I ever bought about climbing was Basic Rock Craft by Roy Robbins. And I basically taught myself how to climb. It was a giant tree in our backyard. It seemed giant. You know, he would put a rope up it and practice rappelling and rappelling off of that and climbing. And then he would ditch school in high school. I didn't know this at the time. And he'd go to Stony Point. And there used to be this old guy out there. We didn't know who he was, really. He was just this uh, silver-haired dude. And he was all ripped. Probably wasn't until I started coming with the Bruin Mountaineers, winter of 56 or early 57, that I actually came to Stony Point. And he go, you know, how does this problem go? I can't figure it out which is all bullshit because he had the thing wired right. But we didn't know that. And he like, help the old guy out with something. You know, make sure your foot's like this and you have to reach up like this and all that stuff. Do the problem and then come down and the guy would flip the problem. You no, know, it's kind of a strange thing because that's, it isn't like I enjoy bouldering that much. Mm -hmm. if, I go, if I go somewhere to climb, I don't boulder. What do you prefer? I prefer climbing. I was mostly influenced by camps through like looking at the guidebook and reading about um, how he put up roots and then later doing some of the roots in Tuolumne and Taquit. I think the first climb that um, really blew me away was uh, Chingadera at Taquit and it was horrendous. After that he was like, God, you know, it was like, damn, that guy could drink some beers too, man. Fucking hell. <laughs> they went into the you know, establishing face climbs at Suicide in, in Yosemite Valley. And they would always talk about runouts and stuff. And then they, when they talked about it, Robbins would always come in. I've had nothing but admiration for Royal as far as what he's done and his ethics. I mean, he just, but he was driven. I always got on fine with uh, these super competitors uh, like Camps. Mm -hmm. uh, I respected Bob a lot. We'd get together, we'd try, you know, to out and climb the other one. And that was always fun. And it isn't that one won and one lost, it's that it brought us both up when I was with him in the needles. We were walking by and I looked up and said, that's an interesting route there, that might go. But you know, it looks like you can maybe get to that point, but I don't know what happens there, you know. And I, was, I was theorizing, but on the other hand, you know, usually when you climb that, you rappel on the other side. If you rappel on this side, you could check it out. And he turned up his nose, basically, and said, that'd be cheating, you know, so. Damn. <laughs> it's always the way I wanted to do roots, is if I were going to go on them, I wanted to lead them. A good philosophy. Start it from the ground and you know, put all your gear in. And I mean, it, it makes you work harder and it takes longer to get. And hang dog is definitely a shortcut to all that. Wrap down, oh, there's a jug there, I just motored to that. All that stuff was tainting. I might take one fall and come down and try it again, but I, I'm not going to hang up there and try to get it. It doesn't. I don't have, I don't see any, to me, I don't see any point in it. In Basic Rock Craft, he's got a chapter in there about ethics. And um, I think one of the things he said was, you know, if you're going to drill a bolt, you should take as little out of the rock as possible. I've always hated bolts because placing a bolt takes brute labor, but it doesn't take particular skill. And as this tightens, this expands and remains permanent in the rock. We needed them now and then. We had to play to use them but they also raise the specter of uh, indiscriminate use, which tends to bring the climb down to the level of the climber, which is just what you don't want to do, because you're there to grow, not to make something else smaller. So if you're gonna start drilling bolts, you just don't do a bolt ladder. You only put a bolt in or take away from the rock when it's absolutely necessary. That made sense to me, so. The idea is not to take a serious risk, by not placing a bolt, but find out if you can't reduce that risk some other way. For example, instead of placing a bolt, spend three hours 
rehearsing the move in your mind. That's really just sort of, sort of a carryover of the backpacking, leave no trace credo. John looked up to uh, Long, called him Largo, and buddies, they're partners. He's way into training, nutrition, everything, just like me. So he shared a lot in that respect. And told great stories, you know, had all these interesting little fables. I met back right at Joshua Tree. At that time, there's not a lot of people going to Joshua Tree, so every weekend, you pretty soon you're climbing together. You know, if your intentions are the same, your energies are the same, and your ambition is the same, we're all really ambitious. So, you know, given that, we're naturally going to gravitate towards one little group. By the time I was in UCLA, um, I started getting into climbing a lot more, and um, I, I got into it so much that I finally decided I was going to quit. I'm a mathematician there. And John would come by my office as he was taking courses. And he was a very good student. He got A's. And then after one year, I, I was just disappointed, of course, that he just decided he was going to climb rocks the rest of his life. I knew one would win out, and I always thought it would be climbing. I try to talk him out of it and say, well, what about you know, the rest of your life? And, uh, you know, how are you going to prepare for other things? And you're good at... Uh, science and mathematics and you got a good mind and you know you can uh, you can write well and you can think well and you know why not just do that why not you know go through the experience of getting an, uh, an education but you know he just wanted to climb so i instantly started studying uh, climbing and training and nutrition and kinesiology and all that stuff as if i were in college and i applied it to climbing he was very quickly doing things that we were not able to do I remember distinctly what really set us off is we went and saw a Bruce Lee movie. Oh man, have you seen Bruce Lee movies? And we're like, who, what, Bruce Lee? You know, he's always working out and punching and doing, I mean, this guy was fit. Damn, that dude was bad, man. That guy has got the philosophy on how to get good at his game, and we'll just take that philosophy and use it for, you know, make it our own. A few years later, he had that book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do. And now it's just amazing. So I applied all that to, to my training. I mean, guys were reading Carlos Castaneda and taking mushrooms and smoking a ton of weed, bad weed too. Um, and so there was a lot of, you know, there was, there was chicanery and foolishness and, you know, new age sort of blue wind. Everybody was trying to sort of take that on board and embody it. And, you know, we did a lot of jackass stuff. Joshua Tree, when there isn't any moon, it gets really dark out there. The idea was to sort of run at speed through the desert and somehow or another, you know, by manipulating your chi or having your energy feel this way or that, you're able to negotiate your way around these barrel cactuses and chilies and what have you. We get spread out over the terrain and everybody, you know, who's running? You know, it's like running for the bulls and five minutes later you hear this. <laughs> Those chilies are nasty. I'm working on a boulder problem and then Backer walks over, he's barefooted. Hey, what are you guys doing, man? And his eyes are blood red. I mean, he had just burned a fatty, for sure. He's got no shoes on. And the thing we're working on, I mean, we're just scratching. The, we're not even getting up. And he just dips a little chalk and then just floats the thing barefooted. Nothing. Like, it was nothing. I, I think it was Midnight Lightning. Left behind the shadow, the remains of a shattered mind. We are left. It just showed that, man, we got a lot of work to catch up. Everybody had a lot of work to catch up. I, I, there was no one that was close to him. I would say that, you know, even though he's my own son, he's one of the most focused people uh, you'll ever find. They used to have those um, presidential fitness tests in high school. And like, I was like, uh, the only guy I beat was a guy named Lauren Fink. And he did a half a pull-up, and I did one. I was just weak, you know, real skinny. Kind of had to train. He was inspiring the watch. Remember the backer ladders? Well, he'd strap 30 or 40 pounds on his waist, and then he'd go up, he'd let go, easily reach, and then he would get to the top, and we'd come back down, he'd go. And then maybe he'd just touch the ground lightly and then go back up. He was smooth, man. I was able to do a two-arm pull-up with 138 and three-quarter pounds. Left arm, one arm's with 12 and a half, and eight and three-quarter on my right. I think they call that OCD, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds boring as shit, but for me, it was like, <laughs> it's, it was good, you know, I liked it.
fucking smooth. He, when, when he was on the rock, he was the smoothest climber still today that I've ever seen. Just had to get some of my aggression out, loosen up a little bit. We've been going after Joshua Tree enough by that time. I remember running in the, in the back and I say, hey, let's go do a little circuit, you know? And he was going, well, where's the rope? I go, no, no, let's do easy stuff without a rope. And he's like, really? I go, yeah, let's just do double cross. We didn't think that was really free soloing because it was it was a scrambling or something like that. But 5.8 was about max. The first time I saw a guy solo 5.9, it was Tobin on uh, North Overhang at Joshua Tree. Tobin would kick in as soon as he's 20 feet out. It's like, <laughs> he took it to another level. That was it. We were off to the races, man, from there. It had all the important food group. It's got adrenaline, fear. Figure things out. It's not easy. I remember one time doing a thing called Billabong, and we got a little bit off the route. And we're on, you know, I was probably, my feet are probably 50 feet off the ground, and it was five, you know, hard 510, 511 friction stuff. And I almost grabbed his foot. He was just right ahead of me. I'm just like, oh my God, I'm going here. And it was just one of those bone crushing, oh. It didn't exactly spark my vigor. There wasn't anyone around, so I thought, well, I'm going I think it's only 5'7. I should be able to solve this with it. Shit. <laughs> I got up there a little ways, and there was a little 5-7 move confronted me, and I couldn't do it. I didn't have the confidence that I could, that this was going to really happen, even though I could climb 5-7 any time. There's a root called Hot Rocks, and the top of it is grisly insecure, and you know, you're dead if you come off it. I mean, it you're, you're not going to survive that. If you did, you'd wish you, you hadn't survived it, but that that same day, he, I, we so we uh, we top roped it free, backer top roped it right after us, and two hours later he soloed it, and we were just going, oh my God, this guy is out of his mind. He did that intentionally just to blow people's mind. And at the time, I thought, you know, that's really too bad that he'd have to do that because he's going to kill himself. I wasn't going to even consider doing that solo. It didn't matter. There's other people that were doing it or not. Backer started the whole big soloing kind of era where you're soloing stuff that's over 100 feet. It was more like, you know, whisper talk. You know, he just. To hear about backer just fucking solo this. He's like, I don't care what you believe, it's, that's cool. It just makes me feel that much better, you know. And then when it was Butterballs, then it was everything was was way up there then. Butterballs, now that's a different deal. Even though he was the best thing crack climber of the era, that is a really uh, that's out there. At the time, that's high-end stuff. 512 plus was just into play. There wasn't even 513. That's really an exposed place. There's no way you're surviving that. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Shiver me timbers. The climb itself is just brilliant. I thought, well, that'd be just like the classic free solo statement. He was kind of the only one doing it, so he had nothing to go by. Like Gil, you know, look, he didn't have anybody to push him. When I first started climbing, you know, the John Gill book were like the thing. We had seen like one picture here, one picture there in somebody's climbing shop or something like that. But then a man collected all the photos and he saw Master Rock. We went to every single picture in that book. We were like, wow, this guy was doing this stuff 20 years ago. I said, you know, we're gonna have to hook up with this guy. One day he goes, oh man, let's go meet John Gill. I'm like, how? I just called him up out of the phone book. Oh man, we gotta go bouldering. And have you, you know, give us a tour if you can, if you'd be so kind. He goes, come on down, boys. <laughs> and whoo! Walk past all these boulders and that place is unbelievable. There's hundreds and hundreds of boulders on this perfect sandstone. And he's only bouldered on three boulders. I remember young John back here, and he was, I think he was only 19 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think I pointed out some boulder to him that I hadn't looked at. So he just went and started doing new problems. So athletic. I mean, 
was like a young Adonis. <laughs> he was so much fun to watch. He was a really gracious guy. Well, John Long, of course, had this tremendous physique. He was sort of surprised when I showed up because he was a pretty big guy and I was bigger. He's like, wow, how do you do that? I go, I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I was going through uh, a period in there which I just kind of temporarily given up climbing. He's got a little pad and he's doing math problems all day. That's all he did because he's you know, a mathematician. <laughs> Which I can relate to, that's my, you know, my dad does that too. He was a hero for a John. He really investigates very carefully, you know. He's passionate about it, you know. He goes far beyond most people, including myself, you know. And he's, I admire him, you know. I mean, I'm proud of him. I wasn't so, I didn't think about pride so much. I mean, he's legendary. Nobody could keep up with him. God, you know, just one on front levers and all this stuff. And he was doing it so far ahead of his time. He's doing the one finger pull-ups. We saw that and we was like, holy shit, this guy's fucking strong. I mean, really fucking strong. We were playing at bouldering back in California, but here was the master. Before I knew what the word bouldering meant, you know, I saw these, these were practice rocks, and the guides went over there occasionally. On each boulder, there would be one or two routes that they did. And I started looking around, and I said, boy, this is just like gymnastics, you know. This is like working the parallel bars or the still rings or something, you know. If you, you can work out routines on these things, you can work out problems that are much harder than these that have been done if you're willing to put a little effort into it. I did go bouldering with them at times, and uh, what was I that like? It was like not being able to do what he did. He was soloing these things that I was having a hard time getting up. <laughs> the rope climbing just didn't interest him. I put away my ropes and equipment in the early 70s. At that time I was doing, still doing a fair amount of bouldering and these solo climbs. I don't know if this is true or not, but I think people like Backer and Gill and the, probably a number of other people who solo are soloing below their, a fair distance below their ability level. I was pushing myself to see what I could do, not necessarily what I could do with respect to what other people could do. And uh, there was no sort of a number scale then, you know, number scale, number scales uh, facilitate some aspects of bouldering, but uh, too often people then become number chasers. It's a moving meditation. To me that was much more satisfying than competing against somebody, you know, or going up one more notch in a grading scale or something. And that's it. That's the only time I ever saw the guy. Really? Yeah. Just that one day. Even though I was in the, probably the best shape of my life, that next day I couldn't make a fist, and, and my forearms were just completely trashed for three days. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even do that. Tip my hat to John Gill. <laughs> the real trick to what Backer did as far as being able to survive all that was he wasn't a big risk taker. You do have to take life with a certain amount of risk. <laughs> On the other extreme, you know, if you take with too much risk, you're gonna, you're gonna kill yourself. I never got the feeling that John was being reckless. John was very careful about climbing. It sounds like he wasn't, but he really was. If lizards can do this, why can't people? There's absolutely no reason people can't do this. He was so precise and mechanical, you know, so like left brain. He'd just, he'd do things the same way over and over and over until he just had it perfect. You know, some people got a little, little waver or, you know, you, you know, you got a little edge to you or, or none of that. And once he'd had it perfect, he'd solo. If I do something, I have to do it all out or not do it, you know? Like if I start, whatever, music. I've been playing sax since I was about 24. Um, and I'd sit there and I'd buy all the books and I'd study all the scales and I'd have to know all the theory and I'd practice everything. Blah, 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 blah. And I would just force myself to do it. I just wanted to do it and I, um, I didn't want to do it half-assed. How do you think soloing was perceived in the climbing community? Because As reckless. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, psy psycho, but people looked up to that. They did. It was it was both because I'm I can't do that because. I'm scared, and he's not, mm -hmm. which puts you on a different level. It's like the warrior that fucking runs out ahead, you know, and, and starts slicing people, you know. It's, he's doing it, let's go, Rawr! You know, most sports you have to compete against somebody, you know. You need somebody on the other side of the tennis net. You, you, know, you need somebody to play basketball with, um, stuff like that. But climbing is one of those sports where you don't. You can just you against the rock, you know, and that's it. And then Croft came in and just, just blew everybody away. Now 
nowadays Yosemite, I mean, it, it still is a really special place. But back when I first started climbing, it was the place. At that time, that was Olympus. I couldn't believe how big the rocks were. It had all the various climbing games in there, from bouldering to big walls. It had the weather. Um, kind of all the most famous climbers either resided there or visited there pretty often. Camp 4 was a place, you know, the Nike Center for all of that. There has been so many fires in Camp 4 that the ground is permanently black. And if you don't have a tent, you you wake up and your, your face is in the dirt, you're waking up in an ashtray. When I first started soloing, I, uh, I remember my friends were heading off to the bakery and I went back to the Squamish apron, it's about 600 feet high, and I sold this 5.7 route. And I'd done it a bunch of times before. So, I mean, it wasn't like a big unknown and I couldn't believe it. It was such a big breakthrough that I, I knew basically that I would never have another breakthrough like that. I knew that anything was possible. When I met Peter, I think he was already soloing the rostrum and Backer soloed the rostrum after Peter. I never really thought about soloing something that hard that was that long. That by far is the most bitchin' solo a guy could probably do. Makes sense. It's the kind of climbing I do all the time, except this one's 900 feet tall. When I did it, I was starting to get kind of jittery once I got to the face traverse. You're not supposed to be there without a rope. You can feel it, it's everywhere. There's like this little 10A smear move. You walk a dog there, a dog goes, fuck you. I ain't going anywhere near that edge. Come on, boy. It's like, no fucking way. It's instinctual. There's a fixed pin, and there's this old taddy sling. It used to be a mini pendulum. It was hanging right beside this hold, and I pulled one side of it open like this and grabbed the face hold so that if I slipped... He figured the sling would catch his elbow. What was I thinking? I can't believe I did that. And so then I went back the next day and then sold it again. And, went... and so then I went back the next day and then sold it again. And when I got to that part, I grabbed the sling and I moved it out around this little edge of rock just so that there's no way so that it was just nowhere near me. Some, that's some ethics, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, I didn't feel right. I had to go back and not do it with the sling. I go, well, you weren't really using it. He goes, yeah, but that's just not right. And I'm like, <laughs> What I always felt was with the really important things in your life, the worst thing is when somebody asks you, so, did you do this thing? And you go, well, yeah, but. That butt is just like the worst thing to have. So I made sure I didn't put my hand through that sling. Peter was, how do I say it? I don't want to say ahead of his time, but he was a, a different kind of individual. Most climbers who he don't solo anyway, they don't understand what it's about. They just think, you know, a guy like Croft can just solo anything and it's no big deal anyway, so they don't pay attention to it. So it's like, it, he does another impressive thing, another impressive thing. He'd do it again, he'd do it again. He'd do it all early in the morning, he'd wake up, because he used to wake up at four in the frickin' morning. Every single day, I don't know how the hell he did it. There's people who have asked me, you know, oh, don't you get bored? And I see them training on plastic. <laughs> or, you know, running on a treadmill, or, or, or say running along a road. I mean, geez, uh, I think doing laps on the rostrum is a bit more fun than running on a road. But the other aspect of that is the moving meditation aspect and becoming smoother and more fluent. It's way zany because you're, you're, you're fighting yourself under extreme duress, all right? You are just, you know, and you're, if you fall, that's, that's it. And you just, you're focusing on the next move and where your foot's going to go, and the next move where your foot's going to go. And I felt myself weaving in and out of the rock. It was an amazing experience. Everything's in my peripheral vision. I'm just going like this. And I had the sensation that I was on like, sort of like an asteroid or a small moon, and the thing was simply spinning, and I was just climbing to stay in the same place. And it was just the coolest thing. Um, and I just, and, and, and I reached a kind of rhythm where fatigue simply didn't enter into it. I could go like this forever. He looked up to Backer. The contrasting personalities of Backer and Croft refute the notion that all free soloists are cut from the same warped cloth. Restrained and thoughtful, Croft is like the moon to Backer's sun. Yosemite was the place in the world. John was the guy. That makes him more than just a climber. He was having breakfast, and I didn't know him that well. And I walked over and I asked him, 
if there's, because I was thinking about soloing the rostrum, if there's, you know, is there anything I should, should know up there? <laughs> he just said, be careful. Backers seem to have a, a little bit more, I don't know if it's aloofness or, I guess maybe arrogance to a certain extent. But I mean, you know, people sometimes give him a hard time about that. Um, but I, I, he, he had so much adulation heaped on him at a really young age. I mean, everybody is telling him he's the greatest. I mean, you're not going to act a little spoiled now and then? We're about to take you up to the top of some very tall mountains, the hard way. What we're going to show you gives new meaning to the phrase, hanging on by your fingernails. from your friend you say yeah you know those guys are really tweaked about all this uh, magazine stuff you're getting in there's more weenies out there now than ever so that just makes me look better in some way boy that felt good hi i'm john backer john backer john backer john backer is one of the best free solo climbers in the world that's right no ropes the only thing preventing him from becoming melon splatter is strength experience and guts whatever you know it, that was a big problem how'd you guys get up here man They didn't want to touch it. They didn't want to print any pictures. They thought if you start publishing uh, free solo shots, the people are going to go out and want to do it and get their picture in the magazine free soloing. That's not going to happen, first of all. People, I guarantee you anybody who gets about 10 feet up and is not comfortable on the climb mm -hmm. is coming down, period. 10 or 20 feet. You just reach a point and you're like, well, maybe this solo thing wasn't such a good idea. I'm coming back down. It happens automatically. I believe that adrenaline and and all that kind of stuff stimulates and highlights your memory cells because there's certain moments that you will never forget. I know there was times where he got into trouble and he's, he's told me a couple times where he fell and he thought it was over. But the real bad one was the on-site solo of uh, the moratorium. Oh, we get this bitchin' route is 5'11", dude. The moratorium. In the guidebook, I knew it was rated um, 11B. Well, you know, it's just like Nabisco Wall is a bit harder. It's 11C, moratorium's only 11B. They don't, you know, so they don't really get it. I think he did it for ego because I, because his standard was so high compared to the guys that put it up. I say, like, yeah, it's you know, one of these modern, uh, overrated, up, upgraded things. You do moratorium and you get it. Like, I mean, when I'm saying do moratorium, you do it with a rope and you kind of go, you sold this? It's so long, you know, really multi-pitch, and that coming out of that flare or into that thin thing up there. I knew there was some funky stemming section. That's all I knew. I didn't know where it was, um, but that was the crux. It's not like it's 5'8 hand cracks up to an 11B crux and it's casual as hell to down climb. There's no crack and it's actually some pretty good holes on the sides of the dihedral. Work my way through it, get to a ledge and I go, whew, that wasn't bad at all, no big deal. Keep climbing, you know, go another 100 feet or so, then there's another stemming section that's a little bit harder. I'm like, uh-oh. It's kind of like screeching to a halt at a black blank wall. You know? There's this, like this cracked plate sitting on, a, on the rock. And this thing, you can just lift it and put it there. But it kind of fits. And you're just kind of poking around and you're going, this is it? OK, I'm going to pull up and I'm going to go like this. And then I'm going to get a, a lock. Look on the right wall. It's pretty steep there. There's this little thing. It looks like a fucking pimple. Slimy, sort of slanting hundreds of feet up. Go for the lock finger doesn't fit. It's not a lock. It's still fingertip. So I'm like that and I'm going, where's the dimple? This is so insecure. It's just glassy for your feet. Fucking put my foot on that fucking dimple and fucking just, I couldn't believe it. I put it on there and it's pushing so hard. Even backer can't make that thing secure because it isn't. All of a sudden, back of the mind, this might be it. So I'm like, keep cool, just keep going. to pushing off that dimple like a motherfucker. Reach up, then I get a finger lock and I'm like, Get to the top, sit there on the ledge, and man, I was just completely hollowed out. I was like, wow, I just got away with some bullshit. That wigged him out. I think he quit soloing for, for a little while.
there's no way you soloed that. They go, yeah, right, buddy, later. <laughs> I didn't really care about that, you know. Um, it's just, yeah, the journey itself is exciting. See, I'm just taking another step. One time when I was in London, I called back home to Yvonne here and, uh, you know, just to check in, see how things are going, tell her what I was doing. And she says, did you hear about your son? I says, no, what happened? He says, well, he climbed El Capitan with Peter Croft in 10 hours. They started at midnight with the miner's lamps, got to the top, rappelled down, had lunch, drove their bicycles over to the base of uh, Half Dome and climbed that and got up to the top at six o'clock. Elapse time for both clients was 14 hours. Well, what would be the coolest link up? I mean, you drive into the valley, you wouldn't even have to be a climber. you just kind of go, whoa, boy, that's a pretty cliff, and so is that one. The thing that's interesting about that is the logistics and all the hiking involved. I mean, that's a lot of ground to cover. It started up in the nose, and you know, although there's a number of parties on that, most people were you know, fast asleep. But we're in the upper dihedrals, massive corner, and I swing into the lead, and it's this place where there's this uh, flake about six feet high, this thick, weighing hundreds and hundreds of pounds. I jump up and grab the top of it, and the whole thing just starts falling out backwards. And I just let go and kind of hop down onto the ledge, and there's this white blur in my left-hand peripheral vision. And it's him leaning forward, grabbing this block and pushing it back in place. Superhero, yep, that's John. Neither of us had done Half Dome before. Okay, Half Dome is an easy wall. Two really super good climbers like that, you can just blaze up that. But boy, that's a lot of hiking. You've already climbed the captain. The big thing on Half Dome was more that there was five separate parties that we had to pass. Most of them were, you know, cool about us going past. They thought that was, you know, just real exciting, particularly once backers said what we were doing. And, uh, but there was, a, there was twice where I was in the lead and I had just gotten up to a ledge and they're like, nope, you can't go past, we just don't do things like that up here. But when both those uh, scenarios uh, played out, it was at a place where John and I had already agreed we were gonna switch over. So I just kept my mouth shut and just figured, I'll let John deal with it. So the first time I get up there, the guy goes, you can't go past, I'm like, oh, okay. And, and then John gets up there and the guy starts to say the same thing and all of a sudden you can see this flash of recognition and just like the this guy's face just goes pale and he goes, oh, you're John Backer. Oh, uh, you can go by and then you know I'm tied at the other end of the rope so I get to go along too but the second time it happened the guy goes you can't go past and I mean he's he's kind of bitter that I'm like right there and John comes up there and then the guys go oh geez you're John Backer okay you can go by John runs out the rope now I have to start climbing now John is is obviously you know not placing a ton of protection he's thinking you know it's five nine Peter's not going to be having any problem with this I go to try to climb past the guy and the guy won't even look at me. He starts leaning out. So I'm doing this weird stemming thing and palming my way up and it's just, it's, it's really quite hard. And I'm just about past him. And I look over and I see where I want to kick my foot up, up on the other wall. And then I look back to where my hand is and I wind up with my foot without even looking and, and go to kick my foot way up on this wall. And he takes this moment to lean f even further back and I end up kicking him in the side of the head like full on really hard and his whole body is kind of does this it's kind of whip back into the corner and you know I'm trying to be polite and everything and apologize but you know I just go yes <laughs> bastard I can't imagine how beat they must have been on top of that thing it, you know it, it's a great performance he was not liked in a lot of circles which I which I saw I think it's because of his ethics 
Yeah. John's philosophy always has been, you never bring down the rock to you, you bring yourself up to the rock. If you can't do it, another climber will do it some other day when the climber is able to do it. At that time, Bagger was sort of, he, was, he, he, he could go in and out of two different sort of personalities. One, he was a pretty solid guy, and another one, he could get really sort of thorny and difficult. I have a, an attitude, a big mouth. Most climbers are that way. They just don't climb at that level. Our school for relationships was kind of slightly out of tune. When I know I'm right and I've done my work, and I, you know, sometimes you know really well what you're talking about, then I don't yield. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just, in fact, at, the, at that moment, I think I would say, yeah, let's get it on. I really like to argue about this, you know, because I'm going to whip your ass, you know. <laughs> Dad's way is the way. It's the right way. Dad knows. I mean, he's the problem solver, and he showed us how, and he care, how he approaches stuff and how he thinks about it. I wouldn't go back and change it because I think it, it, it does, it has a, instilled a lot of good qualities. And it sounds like it's instilled a lot of good qualities in John. In all my dealings with John, he was always polite. I never had any conflict with him. I remember talking to John a few years ago and I was telling him how I just love to go out and solo 5657 five, in Yosemite. I remember being proud of myself because I'd, I'd sold it in 40 minutes, you know. And John told me, yeah, we had these uh, speed trials on that, he says, and uh, you know, I, I set the record there in seven minutes. <laughs> It's a 600 foot climb. I mean, I couldn't run up there in seven minutes. But the next time I climbed it, I did it in 24 minutes because of what John had told me, you know, because he changed the way it looked to me. I was guiding someone and I was about to pitch up, and John comes walking by and he goes, Hey, Peter, um, I just chopped a bolt there so you can see it. What he had done was he had chopped an old quarter inch rusty bolt that was unsafe and put a brand new ring bolt in besides. This, I mean, this is what he could solo you know, blindfolded. He really meant it when he talked about, you know, messing with the rock. If you chopped a bolt, he patched it beautifully. Then it was kind of the bolting wars, you know, no wrap bolt, it's okay to wrap bolt, don't wrap bolt. He got blamed for all kinds of bolt chopping incidents that he was never involved in. If he ever chopped a bolt, he would tell anyone. He would be completely upfront about it. And at the same time, I remember Christian Griffith had come over um, from Colorado and he was like, Wow, man, I did that route to the left, and I saw those holds out there, and I'm gonna go over there and put bolts on rappel on that thing. And I flipped out. I was like, no, you're not. You're not rappelling bolt on that thing. That's like one of the last prizes of Tuolumne. The ethic is ground up for backer, and the ethic is anything goes for, for Christian. Tuolumne is a place where you should go and do climbs and routes on that natural, natural lines and uh, you know, place bolts on lead. It isn't getting the top that counts, it's the way you do it. If there's no inner poetry involved in a particular route, why continue to do it? Everything's disappearing, just left and right, boom, 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 rap bolting. I don't know how you stop that, but I just don't like that at all in Tuolumne. I think that's a good place in a gym. He's gonna go back to the parking lot, and there's this guy there, Yuri, and he's just drinking coffee. He goes, hey, John, what are you, what are you doing? I go, hey, Dave, you want to go do a new climb? And he goes, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Backer, um, went up with his little array of hooks and slings, and he would just go, hook in, and... I already felt bad that I was using hooks. So I went, well, if I'm gonna use hooks, I'm gonna drill as few bolts as possible. It's a wonderful route, man. If, if, uh, if that had bolts on it, it'd be a trade route. But it doesn't have any bolts on it. There were some people who were really critical about John putting in a bolt on the hook. But I didn't feel that way at all. I just thought if you can go up there 30 or 40 feet above your last piece and, and have to use a hook maybe to place a bolt, I mean, I don't know how much further out you need to go. I think that was just an exercise in backers showing what, you know, what kind of mind control he has. I think he did it to watch others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, well, here you go, boys. If you really have it together, here's how you can do it. You can basically do it with no protection. That is a statement. That was the one you take 80 footers on. Pedaling the air bike for 80 feet. And so he basically caught more shit than anybody else in the climbing world. Royals put up roots mm -hmm. and John Backers put up roots. Mm -hmm. And I think that's admirable and people should leave him alone. The climbing world is completely changing. And you've gone from trad, which Backer had pushed as far as anybody could push at that time, to sport climbing, which completely disowned the past. He was standing true to what he believed in. It didn't improve on what he was doing. If anything, it just dummied the game down. You walk out there, he's hanging on the rock. 
Kenshin, I'm free climbing now. I'm practicing this move a couple times more, you know, before I red point. You know what I mean? I just look at that and just go, ah, oh, man, that's ridiculous. He called it like he saw it, and he didn't change like a lot of other people did. And these were people who weren't just sort of, you know, climbing whatever and, and just really easy going. They were saying, I would rather die than rap bolt. I would rather die than hang dog. This isn't just like a sport. This is something that, you know, these people centered their lives around. Because that's all we did was, was climb and you had to, you know, it was like we took it really personally. It's this ideal that, some, that virtually everybody would say is a good thing. But to people who have compromised themselves, it wasn't a good thing because it made them feel shitty every time they saw John. And yeah, it became, became a parking lot struggle. One time he got knocked out by somebody. This was the most outrageous incident to occur in, in Yosemite climbing. It seems to me that anybody who goes around bopping other climbers because of, they make them feel uh, egregious or small or, or they're outspoken is a bad thing. So I, I, I don't think it was simply a matter of everybody being super nice to John, but you know, there's a bit more sport climbing going on. He goes, ah, forget it. You know, there was a lot of uh, just bullshit aimed, aimed at John. He just, ah, fuck it. It was like a, uh, a shooting star that gleams very brightly in the heavens, you know, and then goes out. For everything, it's season, and everybody has a run. A lot, long time, man, you know. Well over 20 years ago, just completely climbing. That's all I did, you know. It's everything. I wouldn't do anything else, like my wife. Well, let's go backpacking for a couple days. No, nope, I'll dep my training schedule, you know. Look, I just completely wrecked that scenario. Um, you know, that's all I thought about. I wouldn't do anything. If it's, you know, even on my rest day, if it messed up my rest day, I wouldn't do it. You know, it's just all about climbing. He says, Dad, you know, he says, look, I've been doing all of these things. He says, and I've been doing it a long time, and he says, and I honestly can't think of anything more else that I can do. He says, I've tried to do everything, and he says, there's nothing left to do. He says, so therefore, why should I keep doing this? I've done it all, you know, and so that's what he tapered off. He didn't go alpine climbing or play golf, I mean, but for the free climbing game, and when I mean that, I don't mean just rope climbing, I mean the whole package, the bouldering, face climbing, crack climbing, bold, run out stuff, the works, being able to travel to other places and climb really hard in those areas, he was the best in the world. Yeah, the stuff I'd seen him do, and it was amazing, it was just amazing. So you go up to the mountain to find out about yourself a little bit, and you see some things about you. You, know, you see new things about yourself and you learn about yourself a lot. And you keep going back to the mountain to find out until you're comfortable with yourself and you don't need to go back to the mountain anymore. There's never been anybody like John Bagger and there never will be. No, I'm here. I'm not in the cemetery. <laughs> That's it, you know, it's like perfect. Now when I go climbing, it's cool because it's like it used to be when I was 16 or something. It's like, okay, let's go climb some rocks. Oh, that looks good. Yeah, fun, fun, boom. That's it. That's all I think about is just have fun. You know, get and pick a nice route and stuff like that. And that's, uh, that's about it. I, I still like free soloing, you know, um, at a much easier level though. I do like five tens and a couple five elevens, but, um, you know, free soloing is the shit. And it's, it's got to be one of the fucking best sports in the world, you know. Just as soon as you get about 15 off the ground, 